Okay, it's 10 o'clock. Hello, and thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's lab meeting. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Vaccines Project, and I will be your moderator today. Due to the rapid spread of the highly contagious Delta variant and its link to increased risk of hospitalization, vaccination remains the top COVID-19 story. In the US, experts are debating whether boosters will be required to augment antibody responses induced by existing vaccines. Officials from Pfizer met with government scientists and regulators earlier this week to discuss an additional emergency use authorization for a booster dose of the mRNA vaccine developed by the company in partnership with German company BioNTech. But both the US FDA and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have publicly stated that for now, booster shots remain unnecessary for fully vaccinated individuals. Meanwhile, Israel recently announced it would begin offering a third dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to immunocompromised adults. In many countries throughout the world, the focus is still getting enough vaccine to deliver even first doses. A recent preprint article suggests that even a quarter of the standard dose of Moderna's COVID vaccine stimulates robust immune responses, which may mean that dose sparing tactics could be one way to help alleviate some of the bottleneck in vaccine supply. As always, we will keep you updated as more data on this and other strategies are released. Before we begin today's presentation, just one note, the information presented today may include some pre-published data that is currently under peer review. We ask that you not reproduce or disseminate the data presented. This session will be recorded and made available on our website and our social media channels for you to review. With that, I am happy to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Carl Diefenbach from the Division of AIDS at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. As director of the Division of AIDS, Dr. Diefenbach oversees a global HIV AIDS research portfolio of more than a billion dollars. Under his leadership, the Division of AIDS supports global research to advance the biological knowledge of HIV AIDS, halt the spread of the virus through the development of an effective vaccine and other biomedical prevention strategies, and develop novel approaches to treat and cure HIV infection, as well as co-infections and comorbidities. The division also fosters partnerships with scientific and community stakeholders to develop and implement effective interventions. Dr. Diefenbach received his bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of Maryland in 1976 and his PhD in biophysics from the Johns Hopkins University in 1984. 40 years after the first cases of AIDS were described, an HIV vaccine remains elusive, yet extensive research on the virus and its immunological consequences have facilitated the development of other vaccines, including those for SARS-CoV-2. Today, we will hear about how we can build on both the successes and failures in developing vaccines against HIV AIDS and COVID-19. During the presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I will ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after the presentation, and we will have about 25 minutes for discussion. It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Carl Diefenbach. And Dr. Diefenbach, you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, I'll do that right now. And um, thank you, Chris Kristen. It's great to be here with all of you, and it's great to have an invitation to participate in this event today. Get the screen shared and go back to from the beginning. There we go. So um, as you've heard, I'm going to talk about building on our successes and failures, um, both um, for how can we can get to a point where we have a safe, effective, and durable HIV vaccine, which is ultimately the key way that we can end this global HIV pandemic. Uh, some housekeeping, I wanna thank um, uh, John and Tony for slides, and I have no competing financial interests. 
Um, and I'll start with a brief outline. I'm going to tell a tale of two viruses. Obviously, the two are SARS coronavirus 2 and um, HIV, but I will pull in some other viruses into the story. Um, I'll talk about what we've learned from decades of work on HIV vaccines, um, what we have learned from studies of other viral pa pathogens, really to stress the importance of the vaccine delivery platform and talk a little bit about the future because that's really where we want to be able to have the discussion today and talk about the creative use of structural biology to help us build a, a safe, effective, and durable HIV vaccine. So um, this is the first virus. It's actually interesting to look at the life cycle of um, SARS-CoV-2 and realize that that little blob in the middle uh, right here that is the nucleus and it is not involved in any way, shape or form. To date, um, we have monoclonal antibodies as entry inhibitors. We have incredible vaccines, um, but we are now working toward um, antivirals. So it's important to note that one of the major challenges, even with the Delta variant, is that a large proportion of all um, SARS-CoV-2 infections arise from asymptomatic transmission, not just from pre-symptomatic people, but um, people who actually never develop symptoms. And actually the data on, on Delta seems to indicate that the pre-symptomatic people have significantly higher viral loads um, in their upper respiratory tract. And that may be one of the major reasons why um, this virus is so uh, imminently transmissible. Additionally, it's important to understand the structure of the pathogenesis um, and that the vast majority of people have mild to moderate symptoms and about 20% of people have severe or critical disease. And, um, the, and the case fat, uh, fatality rate is in the order of um, between one and 3%, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, so what we really wanna be able to do with the vaccine is prevent severe and critical disease. Um, and we have the added bonus with the vaccines we currently have is that we also seem to be able to at least somewhat block um, actual uh, acquisition and, and onward transmission. Now let's flip over to HIV. Clearly the nucleus plays a much bigger role here, but the entry process is quite similar. It uses a spike um, glycoprotein, uh, we call it envelope. It has a co-receptor. Um, and then we have a number of drugs that work along the way, but the diseases are significantly different. With HIV, untreated HIV, um, the red line um, of, of CD4 count is always represented to me the speed with which a person, the drop in CD4 count uh, represents the speed with which an individual progresses toward frank AIDS and the level of the blue line, the virus is the speed of the train on that track. And as everybody is aware, antivirals essentially abrogate HIV replication, um, freeze the immune system in place and allow CD4 counts to re rebuild if you're starting therapy at a high enough level. In the absence of drugs, um, there's a period where you basically feel okay called clinical latency. But at the end of the day, asymptomatic transmission during the acute phase of infections plays a, plays a major role in, um, in transmission and disease for both SARS-CoV-2 and HIV. Obviously the route of transmission is completely different, um, um, but the post acquisition tra uh, trajectory is also quite different. For SARS, pretty much everybody is who's going to convalesce is wrapped up by uh, 14 to 28 days. And to a certain extent, people with become uh, 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 HIV positive feel better within a couple of weeks. Uh, but again, that they are then in this period of clinical latency where the virus continues to um, grow relentlessly at the level of anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 copies per day, per mil in the, in the blood and keep going. And the outcome from infection is different. So many people successfully convalesce from SARS and with HIV uh, back in the day prior to therapy, it was clearly a nearly universal death sentence. So let's start with where we have been in terms of um, the the laundry list of disappointing HIV vaccines going all the way back to microgenesis in uh, 18, um, 18, 1987. We're not that far into the epidemic, but uh, you know, clearly prior to the turn of the century. 
all the way up to uh, the 702 result, which was just reported in 2020. In all these cases, there was essentially no level of, uh, of efficacy detected by any of, of these vaccines. And now we'll spend a couple of minutes and ask the question, why? So going back to the earliest where we were using um, uh, uh, GP120s uh, as immunogens, uh, uh, and that was the antibodies, and frankly, the antibodies that were induced against GP120 did not effectively bind native trimer, nor did they neutralize um, intact HIV. And um, part of the challenge we face is the structure of the HIV envelope glycoprotein, it is covered with this thing called a glycan shield, uh, which we all realize is um, just an incredible amount of glycosylation or sugar on the surface of the envelope that protects most of the epitopes from easy detection by monoclonal antibodies or antibodies that are generated in response to infection. Moving on to the ad five story, um, you know, we went through a stage where let's see if we can induce antibodies, and if we can't induce antibodies, let's see if we can induce um, a robust CD4 or CD8 cell responses um, using adenovectors. What we saw was um, that the body's response in terms of the number of epitopes was quite few, um, on the order of anywhere from one to three, and that was clearly inadequate in terms of functionality, quality, and quantity that the, vir the virus could easily escape uh, these epitopes. And in fact, a lot of the epitopes were not the dominant epitopes or uh, conserved epitopes, and hence escape was easy. So we had all kinds of problems with inadequate help, um, um, slow recall responses, as well as just the coverage that we were able to induce um, with the ad vectors. Um, additionally, the ad vectors themselves, had, particularly ad five, had secondary effects by in people who are priorly positive with ad five uh, had an increased risk of acquisition if they engaged in um, uh, uh, insertive anal sex. Along then, we had a period where we were really excited by the first signal of efficacy that emerged from RV144. And then you can see this paper was published um, in December of 2009. Um, and what we saw was that um, through really elegant work by a large number of labs that there was the appearance of a possible correlate. Um, an antibody to the V1, V2 region was associated with reduced risk of infection. Um, these were non-neutralizing antibodies, and so the hypothesis was, can antibodies mediate ADCC as the virus buds um, and really help to prevent HIV acquisition? So um, as a group of scientists are want to do, we set out to, um, uh, to focus on antibodies to OMV and to repeat the RV144 concept using an improved um, uh, vaccine that didn't change the adjuvant and moved to a clade C environment. The HVTN702 study opened in October of 2016, um, was fully enrolled, and um, in February of 2020 um, was declared futile uh, and vaccines were stopped. So, um, you know, the question is why? Um, and I think this is a a question that requires um, uh, some level of understanding. And um, just to rule out the obvious things, like um, did was the vaccine response uh, similar enough that it was, in fact, a reasonable replication of, um, of RV144? Was there, was there um, adjuvant-based T cell activation, um, or was it something unique about uh, clade C viruses? At the end of the day, as you can see from the Kaplan-Myers, there was absolutely no evidence of a, of a signal. And so uh, we're left with the question is, was the efficacy signal seen in RV144 a ceiling or a floor? And I think that is something that will be debated. Um, we have gone back and looked and there are subtle differences in the immune responses to 
uh, RV144 and what was seen in HVTN100. But I see uh, this is a, a, an opinion now, um, and so we can debate opinions that the, the, the subtle differences are insufficient to explain um, the differences that we saw in efficacy. And in fact, if they were identical, would we have seen something that was so much, was more robust than the 31%? So I think from my perspective, uh, the answer is that what we are seeing in the efficacy signal is probably a ceiling. Um, and I'm not sure we can get past it using this kind of a construct. But again, this is open for debate and discussion. Currently, we have two ongoing efficacy studies using a different system. It's the AD26 vectored mosaic vaccine uh, plus clade C GP140 from, um, from Janssen. Uh, the, the women's study in Bokoto was launched in November of 2017 and was active through the entire pandemic. In fact, there were a couple of major um, study visits that needed to occur during the pandemic. And this is another point is that the clinical vaccine research that we have been able to support uh, through the pandemic and before has not only allowed this study to uh, reach full enrollment and um, continue, but it will also served as the backdrop and one of the major tools with how we evaluated the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. So this was launched in 2017. Uh, the men's study was launched um, in September of 19 and is quickly approaching full enrollment as well. So we still have efficacy studies in the field and we await these results. So at the same time, during the time of the RV144 result breaking and being developed as a vaccine concept, a significant amount of work was done on HIV envelope um, structure in terms of building uh, SOSIPs and stabilized envelope structures, as well as the detection and isolation of a series of broad neutralizing antibodies that target very specific epitopes on the virus. You can see the sites there from the CD4 binding site, the V2 apex. Uh, so these five um, sites uh, represent major sites of virus neutralization. These are referred to as broad neutralizing antibodies. To give you a sense of how these could be combined, I went into an old CROI from uh, 2016 and pulled out a figure from a Mike Seaman paper that showed how these antibodies could be combined and give you coverage of, um, uh, of clades across um, the, uh, the distribution of the world. And you could see that uh, on, the, on the Y axis, you have cumulative coverage of combinations uh, versus uh, predicted IC, IC80s um, across the X axis. And you can see there's a continual left shift to uh, better neutralization with more antibodies. So the really this calls the question of how many epitopes do you need to target um, in order to make a vaccine? Um, and the, the answer may be uh, maybe three, um, but you know, we really don't know. Results from uh, the uh, just completed uh, study of eight, that HVTN um, and HPTN ran of evaluating RV144, the AMP study demonstrated that one antibody was not sufficient to fully protect, but was able to um, uh, neutralize virus that was at a, a specific concentration. And so that was a baseline starting point to think about either antibody therapy or uh, building a better HIV vaccine. So clearly the goal is to be able to take these immunogens of, uh, that are stabilized as trimers and figure out how to turn these stabilized trimers into immunogens that, that while they bind neutralizing antibodies um, can then um, be used to trigger uh, broad neutralizing antibodies in a consistent way in a large number of people that would receive such a vaccine. So we have um, this kind of an approach. Now switching gears a moment, keeping in mind that we just talked about the HIV vaccine story of needing to use stabilized trimers, 
This is a paper that Dr. Fauci wrote that came out uh, just recently that really talked about the story behind the scenes of the coronavirus vaccines. And this is a story I never get tired of telling or hearing because it is just such a feel good story for the world. Uh, and that is, is that through the, the expert work of the Vaccine Research Center, um, which was really focused on uh, basic and preclinical and clinical research to develop vaccine platforms, they had focused for nearly a decade on stabilization of prefusion spike proteins. And this kind of work really set the stage for what um, was able to be done with SARS-CoV-2. Additionally, the work that the Division of AIDS and the D and DMID have done with the domestic and international clinical trials networks for HIV and influenza gave us the groups, the, the infrastructure in which to per, uh, perform these trials. So the first of these papers was um, from 2013, keeping in mind that um, the first uh, paper on SOSIPS came out also around that time. So people were thinking just uh, very broadly about the need to take these floppy envelopes, whether we call them S glycoproteins or envelope and stabilize them. So we made a structure that was um, closer to our vision of lock and key for the correct structure that could then be used as a vaccine immunogen. So Jason and Barney and Peter Kwong had looked at RSV first and really demonstrated that there was a, a quality prefusion form of the F protein, and then one that was actually not a good immunogen at all, and the antibodies that it produced were pretty terrible, and by stabilizing it, we're able to build a vaccine immunogen. Moving forward to um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, um, uh, this work was, pu was published um, uh, in, in 2020, but in the meantime, the, the VRC had worked on second generation versions of stabilized um, envelope glycoproteins or S glycoproteins by building MERS and SARS-1 vaccines using this same sort of process. So by the time we get to the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, this team has extensive experience stabilizing the SARS glycoproteins and then turning them into immunogens. Um, and this was the MERS result that was published in 2017. And then this was the prefusion form that was done for SARS-CoV-2 that was published in 2020. So previous, that one I showed earlier was, was SARS-1. So what's the timeline that we, we saw? So in terms of, you know, if you look at the need to respond to a pandemic and you are measuring the speed with which a pandemic emerges in hours to days. Uh, with the first SARS um, epidemic, we were able to get a DNA-based vaccine up and into people in 20 months. Um, for Zika, uh, then uh, you know, 13 years later, it was three uh, and a half months, three and a quarter months. And with SARS-CoV-2, the sequence was available on January 13th. And within two months, um, we had the Moderna vaccine available. And this is, uh, I think, one of the real strengths of what we were able to do is because of the decades of work on the stabilization of coronavirus glycoproteins, as well as other viral glycoproteins, we had a very good sense of what, how to do this. Because there was an ongoing collaboration with Moderna, and Moderna had spent nearly um, had several years perfecting their process of making RNA and making an RNA-based vaccine, we were able to quickly pivot and make the mRNA called mRNA-1273, which became the basis of the um, Moderna vaccine. And that study started on March 16th of 2020. So at this point in time, I'd like to now give credit to another part of the federal government. Um, uh, which is, uh, is a group at BARDA, um, which was largely responsible and is responsible for pandemic preparedness. And in the past had worked on, uh, on flu vaccines and uh, uh, acquiring and stockpiling 
um, uh, anti flu antivirals, as well as other treatments for viruses of pandemic potential. But in collaboration across the US government, um, there was a decision made to think about this as platforms. Are there, uh, can we get, um, you know, one from column A and one from column B? So we went with RNA um, and Moderna uh, was brought in as an, as an mRNA. Um, the BioNTech-Pfizer uh, collaboration was brought in by BARDA, uh, not so much to support the research, but in terms of mitigating risk and advanced purchase agreements. Two adeno vectors were, were backed, the AstraZeneca chimp ad, which was um, the uh, basically the Oxford vaccine, and then Janssen's ad 26 vector, and then two proteins, which were also seen as, as really important in terms of um, once it could be figured out how to be manufactured and scalable, these could be um, moved quickly and potentially be used around the world. Suffice it to say, all six of these vaccines, as, as written on the screen, have now been um, uh, initiated into clinical trial. Uh, just to spend a moment talking about how messenger RNA works, it's interesting to think about that you could encap. So those of you who, like me, worked on messenger RNA um, as part of our careers, the idea of taking a messenger RNA and injecting it into a person and actually having it function is really a testament to the quality of the ability to envelope and sequester the, the messenger RNA in a protective lipid coat as a nanoparticle. So it actually could get into cells and, and become a true messenger RNA. Um, it, this picture shows that going into muscle cells, there's some open discussion about how diverse and how far the messenger RNA moves around the body um, uh, in terms of other tissues that um, uh, can also end up uh, acquiring the ability to produce S glycoprotein uh, on its surface. So where we are today, um, both obviously both Moderna and, um, and Pfizer are under EUA. J&J &J is under EUA. Um, AstraZeneca has completed their trial, have not really completed their application for an EUA. Uh, Sanofi and Novavax, uh, Sanofi is in phase two fa and now phase three. Novavax has completed their trial and is in the process of filing their EUA. So if you think about the six companies that were backed by uh, uh, BARDA and the US government, it's pretty amazing that we were able to get success on all of these. And from the per perspective of the globe, the fact that we still have the protein vaccines to come online, this can only be a good thing in terms of where we can get with mass vaccination globally. So to sum up what we know about coronavirus vaccines, they're incredibly efficacious in clinical trials. They're also incredibly effective in real world settings. And you can look at the data coming out of Israel, uh, coming out of England on, um, on the Oxford vaccine uh, and the work that's being done in the United States by the CDC on uh, the impact of uh, both Moderna and Pfizer vaccine here yeah, um, in terms of safety. Now, we, we, I'm not going to spend any time talking about the safety signals that have emerged, uh, but I maintain that in a risk-benefit analysis, these vaccines are significantly safer than uh, the risk of coronavirus disease and um, progression to uh, a ventilator and hospitalization. So what's the way forward? Um, uh, if we make an antigenically stable, uh, an ant antigenically stable immunogen as identical as possible to the native structure, uh, it has clearly been an outstanding vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. Um, um, all the platforms that we just discussed, uh, vectored protein, and uh, messenger RNA have been able to deliver um, antigen and produce re a robust immunity and protection from disease. Can we harness these principles of stability and identity and apply them to HIV vaccine uh, vaccinology? So this was one of the earlier structures um, uh, really demonstrating the, the glycan shield. And this is the challenge we face um, is 
dealing with the glycan shield and the fact that the epitopes that we wish to get at are so sequestered under the glycan shield. Uh, and you know, this puts it in a slightly different graphic. The antibodies started being discovered in 2009. Um, they not uh, anywhere from 25 to 35 percent of people uh, who are living with HIV can make these antibodies. So we have this issue with it's they're not universally made. They're made after a long time of infection. Um, and there are some very unusual features uh, about these antibodies that make them difficult to trigger. Uh, here's the, again, the mapping on the structure of where the binding sites are. So can the principles of stability and identity be applied? And my thought is just simply stabilizing and uh, locking in a structure is not sufficient to construct an HIV vaccine. I think what we really need to do is be able to isolate and develop very specific epitopes um, and um, combine these into uh, vaccines that induce broad neutralizing antibodies. And in fact, some of this work has begun with the work of Bill Sheaf and colleagues at, um, at Scripps in, in collaboration with Aavi, the VRC um, and GW. They've demonstrated a very potent response against EOD GT8 and uh, demonstrated that you can initiate um, BNAB lineages by starting with this level of triggering. But you know, how many steps will be required and how many will we ultimately need to move forward? So I would, I would say that, that is an, these are active areas of research, but based on the ability to use messenger RNA now, I think we need to, to take a step back and consider other ways of identifying epitopes. Um, and consider other strategies for building a safe, effective, and durable HIV vaccines. And I am going to close with some blue sky thoughts on that subject. And that is, is to, to start from the perspective of uh, what is occurring during natural HIV infection. And that is, is that within the integrated genomes, the vast majority of proviruses are defective. Um, and as if we think about, as we look at the different parts of the virus and what fractions of these are defective across the, the genes and um, structural parts of the virus, you see that the, the level of, of defectiveness varies from at, at the size site from 20% all the way up to near 95% across the, the spectrum. So the way to think about this, are there conserved epitopes that are shared by all defective and intact proviruses that could be pooled and targeted either through um, developing structurally based defined B cell immunogens or uh, alternatively uh, T cell epitopes that could be appropriately placed on a messenger RNA as a, as a series of beads on a string, uh, similar to what has been tried in the past, but really focus on highly conserved elements that are across um, uh, not just an individual, but across cross clades. And in some ways that's what the mosaic vaccine has been attempting to do um, in a very global way. Uh, so I think in some ways we get we may get a signal for that. The other area I want people to think about is if you think back to the work of George Shaw and Beatrice Hahn and others, um, they were more in the non-human primate area, but in people who were doing deep sequencing on acutely infected individuals. And you look at the, um, the single genome sequences, there are very clear parts of the genome that are reproducibly targeted first for mutation as um, infection is being established. To me, those represent places where the virus is um, very specifically avoiding immune response by mutating rapidly around it. So can you define not just the target uh, naive sequence, but also the sequence and structure that are, is migrated to via the process of mutation and design vaccines. So you are essentially creating a bottleneck for the vaccine, for the virus not to be able to mutate around. And the, inter the reason I mentioned George and Beatrice at, um, at this point is if you look at um, some of George's and Beatrice's early work in this area, a large number of the mutations that were seen were 
Some of the first were in the LTR themselves. And so what are the sequences that are in the LTR? What is, the, what is being coded there that we are not capturing when we measure it elsewhere? So those are some thoughts on that. So um, I, I wanna close with one other possible alternative way. And that is just to remind everybody that on the non-human primate side, we have had great success in the, the recess CMV model. Um, and uh, Lewis Picker and his team deserve a lot of credit for that work. But can the, the work that's been done on creating a, a vision of how the um, recess CMV vector works be linked then to um, also inducing antibodies. So we're getting the best of cellular immunity as well as the ability to induce um, vaccines. And as many of you are aware, um, Veer Biosciences um, has uh, been in the process of bringing a human CMV into clinical trial and we await those results. Uh, so this is an important area to also consider. So we have structural strategies using um, newly defined epitopes or go through a process of in silico mining for epitopes. We have the defined epitopes from BNABs and we also have the ability to then link with uh, the CMV story. So I'll close there and answer questions and I appreciate um, your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Diefenmark. I really appreciate that. Um, so I will kick off some of the questions that we've been getting in the Q&A. Um, and the first one has to do with what you think the mRNA platform will be able to bring that the DNA platform failed to deliver. So I think there's a, there's a real, so I think there's a, a level of efficiency with the RNA platform that we don't get with DNA. But what DNA allows you to do is deliver a, um, a gene product that can be um, of multiple, can, can be combined and made up of multi polypeptides. So on a single DNA with two promoters, uh, you could get a um, get a, a, a two or three or four, as many promoters as you can put on the DNA, uh, you can make polypeptides that could self-assemble into a different structure. To make a bisestronic messenger RNA it wouldn't work as well. And if you're just mixing RNAs, you're not guaranteed to get the mix. So I think there is a reason for pursuing DNA, but is it, to me, it's of a narrower interest because it's, it's nowhere near as efficient as the messenger RNA. Right, right. And how do you see the, the messenger RNA platform now being applied to HIV vaccine development? Well, so I was talking about that as, as there's two ways it can be used very quickly. One is for screening purposes. Is right. it, you, can, you don't have to make a protein, purify it, and then figure out how to adjuvant it and put it in. In the meantime, if you can code it, and it's not modified in some biochemical way that doesn't necessarily reflect what can be put into um, the nucleic acid sequence, you can very rapidly address its antigenicity, uh, um, either by production in cell culture, getting it up expressed on the surface of cells, or directly in animal models. Um, I think the challenge will be is if we have to get to a, mo a modified protein structures that are chemically modified prior to storage and immunization. Um, I don't think messenger RNA will be able to handle that. The other area is you can break this thing down, these structures down into pieces and build structures that are the, the perfect keys for the locks we wanna um, unhook. Right, right. So we have a question about the considerations for a live attenuated vaccine for COVID-19. I think that's an interesting question. And the question is, do we need it? Mm. You know, I think that the, I think where we have, so again, uh, because um, my advice is worth what you're paying me to give it, um, <laughs> get my advice for free. I, I think where we are right now is we need to be thinking about a universal pan beta coronavirus vaccine. And I think that's the next step is, are there epitopes that we can muster, that we can mount strong immunity against? Are there shared um, T and B, other major T cell epitopes that can be harnessed 
so that we can build a vaccine that will work not just against SARS-2, but SARS-22, because we will have additional uh, coronaviruses emerge. And, you know, uh, three strikes and you're out. Um, it tells us that, you know, we're going to keep getting this pitch inside. Right. Right. So we have a question about whether you would address, um, from your opinion, some of the ethical issues around giving COVID boosters when so much of the world has yet to receive a first shot. And I think even more broadly speaking, you know, HIV has really um, changed the world in terms of ethical considerations and of human rights. And so, you know, how, how do you think about that question in terms of also your work on HIV? So I am excited about the number of vaccines that we will have online this fall or winter and the ability for us to quickly expand access around the globe. It is essential that we make these vaccines as universally available as possible. Uh, but it's not just enough to provide the vaccine. We also have to prepare the world to have the wherewithal to deliver the vaccine. You know, you just can't ship vials. You also have to ship syringes and, and other things to go with that. I think there are populations where it is ethical to provide a boost. I mean, there's a large number of people who take methotrexate or other um, B cell um, killing agents because they have autoimmune diseases or they have cancer where we do need to boost. And that's the population that Israel has chosen to start with, um, with their booster. I think that there will be a point in time where the either the vaccine effect wanes or there is escape. And at that point, it will be reasonable to boost. But I think where we are right now, I agree with, obviously I agree with the US government position that at this point in time, there is no data to say the general population of the United States that's been vaccinated needs a vaccine. And the Biden administration has really done an outstanding job in under what we are allowed to do, move the vaccines we have out and sharing them. Um, and that's why I'm excited about bringing the Sanofi vaccine, the Novavax. And as soon as we get um, BLAs on these other vaccines, um, they can move. We really need to expand global production and access. Right, right. Well, we actually have a question on that. Do, do you think that in the future, mRNA vaccines could be made more thermostable or is the solution to global vaccination campaigns multiple vaccines with different storage requirements or ease of administration? So that's an interesting question. And I don't have a, a strong opinion on that. I think that we have to think about what it's going to, so part of where we are at the NIH and other governments around the world is how do we prepare for the next epidemic and the one after that and the one after that. And one of the ways obviously is to see if we can um, easily induce broad neutralizing antibodies against that uh, virus as a pandemic concern, define the epitopes, discover how to stabilize or do whatever we need to do. Because not every virus um, binding protein is gonna be amenable to the kind of stabilization that we have seen for coronavirus and RSV. But figure that out. And then it's entirely reasonable to build RNA vaccines and test them in animal models. And then we would be ready to go in an emergency situation as an outbreak um, uh, came along. That just is logical. I'm not giving away any state secrets on that. Every Everybody's thinking exactly the same way on this, right. but it, the proof is in the execution and the beauty of the science that comes out with uh, the cleverness with which virologists studying Bunia viruses are going to be able to divine um, how to stabilize um, and things like that. So long term, then, um, will the uh, vector system such as N26 prove uh, in some way to be as good I mean, we were still waiting for the Ensemble 2 data to come out, which was the, the boosted version of Ensemble 1. Uh, you know, a vaccine that is more thermostable may be possible. You know, the biophysics of, of messenger RNA storage um, is one that we really need to think about. Also, we need to think about the excipients 
and what's going into the, the lipid nanoparticle because mm-hmm. uh, that also has to be compatible with uh, being non-allergenic or immunogenic in people as well. Right. So I think there's a lot of research that can be done on that. Remember, we started from a point of where everything had to be minus 80 or below. It had to be thawed within 30 minutes and then be ready and to a point where both through stability studies, both Pfizer and Moderna now know that it is a lot, you have a lot more flexibility in this, in this space. But it's not great. It still has to be shipped. Right. Uh, the other, ch- I, let's be honest. The other thing we need to be working on is moving toward a single shot. Uh, you know, how much better would we be if it's not just dose sparing, but you were one and done? Um, and I think we're not over that yet. Um, and we need to figure that out, not right. just for SARS, but for future pandemics as well. Absolutely. Um, so we have a question on the determination of conserved epitopes um, from a self-professed non-HIV specialist and asking, saying that that should be a rather simple bioinformatics question. And has that work been done? A lot has been done in this area. And I, I, I hats off to people like Betty Korber that have led the way for decades in this space. The issue is, how do you then take that information and turn it into a functional vaccine? And as I said, that's the mosaic vaccine that um, is being evaluated um, currently in uh, Mosaico and in Bakoto. Is that that is a structured and the the non-human primate work that Dan Baruch did, who helped pioneer this vaccine, indicates that we get on the looking at non-human primates, we do get significantly more epitopes and and also the clinical analysis of of specimens um, indicates that we're we're better. But how do we then, uh, and that works for T cells, but how do we then find these conserved epitopes and really understand their, their, the protein structures they encode? Another point is HIV exploits all three reading frames in the genome. And um, we need to think about what are the proteins that are made out of frame uh, just as part of normal replication and how immunogenic are those? We don't look for these. And so there are some very novel things that we have seen in non-human primates that truly haven't been exploited by looking at those kinds of responses and um, is that the secret? Because uh, HIV has been so good about anticipating where we're gonna go and having an answer for us before we even get there. So we need to start thinking a little bit more outside the box and think about not just the antisense, but um, things that are caused by frame shifts or other, other dri- you know, there's a whole theory in flu immunology and other immunology that the danger signal comes from uh, uh, damaged proteins being made. And those danger signals are in some ways more valuable getting things started in the right direction than in um, the actual proteins uh, themselves. So we really need to go back and look at at some of the early, earliest um, information that we get out of uh, acute infection in this regard. Right. So we have a question on whether you think the success of COVID vaccines will help HIV vaccine development or perhaps have the opposite effect by highlighting how difficult a target HIV truly is? I think the answer, so the answer to that question is both uh, uh, infectious disease. Um, with Drew and the and the people uh, working with the um, with Moderna and the VRC in this area of trying to use it as an HIV vaccine, so I think that's one of the great parts of this story. We'll go back to that, mm-hmm. but we need to figure out exactly what the epitopes are and and work through that. Mm-hmm. I think it does highlight, and that's why I spend so much time talking about the differences between these two viruses. Is you know. The vast, vast, vast majority of people infected with SARS-CoV-2 convalesce and are fine. We are aware of long COVID and we are aware that it has a death rate. But, you know, 38 million people have died of HIV infection. 
and over you know 75 million have become infected. So that is not a good ratio mm -hmm. uh, that we're facing with HIV. The other thing I want to put on the table is the continued improvement of antiretrovirals and the ability of long-acting antivirals. Um, and it's not, I mean, we're in some ways, you know, PrEP is amazing. Therapy is, is the godsend. We all agree on that. That has allowed for um, people living with HIV to um, practice U equals U, uh, untransmittable equals un, un, undetectable equals untransmittable. And you are then, you, you can feel stigma free. You can move on in your life and feel like you are a whole person. And self-stigma is one of the most destructive forms of stigma. And we can, um, can deal with that then. But at the same time, if we're getting to a point where we have medications, which can be given in low volume that last and protect the body for six months or a year, right. that's a very high bar for um, a vaccine to approach. Yeah. So what we need to do is compare what a vac the rather than comparing vaccines to drugs, what we need to do is be comparing vaccines to what we can find, what we can expect from combinations of monoclonal antibodies. And I think that's the fair comparison as we go forward, because that could be done in a level of you could be we should be able to get to a point where we can induce a vaccine that gives that level of protection. Um, and then it's sustained for three, five, 10 years. Um, and at that point, it's better than um, an injectable medication. So taking the very long view, there is still a space for uh, a safe, effective, and the key words there are safe, effective, and durable HIV vaccine. But definitely the bar has, gets raised every time there's a breakthrough in HIV. Right. And have you been surprised by the maybe slow development of antivirals for SARS-CoV-2? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Um, and there's a there's there's structural reasons. Uh, um, there's political reasons, which I obviously will not touch with a ten foot pole. Um, <laughs> but I would argue with you the, that that is uh, not a true statement mm -hmm. because what we have had was the development of, broad, of neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, albeit they require infusion and now sub-Q administration. But the United States government has bought um, several million doses of the Lilly combination as well as the Regeneron combination. And for whatever reason, they are not being used the way they could be. And when we say there are no drugs, I, I respectfully disagree. Anybody who's symptomatic and has risk should be asking their doctor, like, why the hell aren't you getting me to a hospital and having me infused with a Regeneron cocktail? Mm -hmm. That is a, a surefire way of preventing people from progressing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the, that is one of the communication failures in this is that we have not been able to make this idea stick in the American mindset that there is, um, there is treatment out there um, if you get sick. And that applies for people. You know, the reason we care about that is it's, it's not just the unvaccinated. If you have somebody um, that's immunosuppressed and they get infected and the vaccine hasn't taken in, they should be first in line to get antibody. Mm -hmm. So to me, um, I, I, I differ that we have not done a good job on drugs. I think small molecules are coming um, we've got three in, in phase two, phase three trial at this point, but a lot of time was spent, and this is a debate, on, um, on repurposing known agents. Right. And many of these have proven to be incredibly valuable in the space of people who are hospitalized, where right. we have you know, this, this transition of disease, which I didn't talk about at all, from um, a viral syndrome to an inflammatory syndrome. And that transition where you move over into the inflammatory syndrome, a lot of um, monoclonal antibodies that are uh, targeting host factors or parts of the immune system have proven to be pretty powerful. Um, and of course there's um, uh, dexamethasone, which is the great equalizer in all this. Right. We, right. we have to think about the disease state as well. I didn't talk about that at all. Right, right. 
So we have a question on how does HIV envelope trimer expression via an mRNA vaccine compare in antigenicity to native-like HIV trimers? We don't know the answer to that question. We're in the process of initiating the first studies of messenger RNA delivery of trimers. Um, and bring me back in six months and we may have an answer. But that, that, those experiments are, are teed up. The, the, the messenger RNAs are made and ready to go. Um, it's a matter now of uh, uh, doing the, the studies. Okay. And we, are, we have three teed up and ready to go. So given the maybe less than ideal uptake of the antibody treatments for COVID, what do you see as the role of passive immunization for HIV prevention using antibodies? So I think that that's where there needs to be, that's where I think there's greater competition between um, antiviral medications and, and antibodies. So here's, here's the, the calculus. If you have a single drug that you can inject and it'll stay in the body for six months and give you 99.9% .9 protection. And then you get another shot and there's some uh, degree of coverage or um, say there's a safety window where you can be maybe a, um, a couple of weeks later or a month later versus a, a, a triple combination of antibody where maybe the best coverage you can get is 70 or 75%. And maybe the best you can get is also six months, but probably closer to four months. What's the calculus there? And why would you use an antibody versus um, uh, the drug? And there's an answer to that question. And the answer is, is there a vaccinal effect of having the antibody on board? And we don't know that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where research needs to be done on antibody effector function and whether or not antibodies can be harnessed uh, to provide a vaccinal effect where essentially they're part of the cocktail that is part of your pre-exposure prophylaxis, mm -hmm. but should you be exposed, they act as a way to boost the immune system and help you get a response. So to my mind, it's not clear yet whether or not antibodies will win the day uh, but you know, we'll see. Uh, so I, I have an open mind on this, but I am, uh, again, you come to a fork in the road, you take both. Uh, that's <laughs> okay. what you have to do. You want the best medicines for people, not just, and this is about the world. It's about controlling a global pandemic. Um, and we cannot lose sight of the fact that HIV remains a massive challenge to the globe even in the face of SARS-CoV-2. We right. also have TB epidemic that needs attention. So um, the old diseases cannot be forgotten. They're not going away. In many ways, um, the, the SARS pandemic has made both of them worse um, in terms of because of people, um, you know, stockouts for antivirals or just people stopping prep because they're depressed and they're at home and they can't, get out to the pharmacy or just lose interest in that. Um, I mean, we are human and we need to just now, as we come out of the SARS pandemic, redouble our efforts to get um, treatment as prevention as rolled out as, as far as possible, get as many people on PrEP and continue to fight stigma um, and uh, structural racism and, um, and um, all other forms of inequality that are, impede our progress on HIV and to a certain extent also impede our progress on ultimately vaccinating the globe for SARS-CoV-2. Well, I think that might be the perfect place to stop. <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you so very much, Dr. Diebenbach, for your presentation today. We really appreciate your taking the time to share this work with our audience and for answering so many of the questions. I'd also like to thank all the attendees for participating in today's webinar and for submitting such great questions for our speaker. Uh, we are so fortunate to have such an engaged audience for these lab meetings. And I invite you to join us two weeks from today on July 29th for the next Global COVID Lab Meeting. Our speaker that day will be Dr. Stanley Plotkin, 
veteran vaccine developer, emeritus professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania and founding board chair of the Human Vaccines Project. And his presentation will focus on the correlates of protection by vaccines. And if you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please sign up for the HVP COVID Report, a bi-weekly newsletter that provides insights from experts around the globe and highlights the latest scientific articles and data. Finally, please visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn, where we will upload a recording of today's webinar. And with that, I'll say thank you again for participating today. Stay safe, and we hope that you'll join us again for the next Global COVID Lab meeting. Thank you so much, everyone.